Hello and welcome to a Sports Affinity webinar presented by the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs. FJMC is the parent organization of over 200 conservative men's clubs around the world. FJMC has presented more than 100 webinars since the pandemic began. We work hard to provide value to our members and to the Jewish community in general. For example, FJMC offers you an opportunity to express yourselves through participating and leading activities that are most important to you. I'm Dave Kravitz with Danny Mando, my co-chair, and we'll be hosting tonight. We're going to mute everyone so we can enjoy the presentation. We'll be unmuting after the presenter's remarks so we can take questions. If you're enjoying our webinars, please validate your support with a contribution to FJMC by going to fjmc.org slash donate. It is now my pleasure to introduce Jonathan Eig. And this is actually, I'm really looking forward to this presentation, to say the least. Jonathan is the author of five books, three of them New York Times bestsellers. Ken Burns calls him a master storyteller. Joyce Carol Oates referred to his book, Ali, A Life as an Epic of a Biography. Jonathan was born in Brooklyn and graduated from Northwestern University's Middle Italy School of Journalism. He is a former staff writer for the Wall Street Journal. His books have been published in more than a dozen languages. His first book, Luckiest Man, The Life and Death of Lou Gehrig, won the Casey Award for Best Baseball Book. Ali won the Penn slash ESPN Award for Literary Sports Writing. Ali was named Best Book of the Year by Sports Illustrated, one of the 10 Best Nonfiction Books of the Year by the Wall Street Journal, and one of the New York Times Notable Books of 2018. Esquire magazine called Ali one of the 35 best sport books ever written. The book won best overall books in the British Sports Awards. It was a finalist for the Mark Linton History Prize, the Plutoric Award, the William Hill Award, the James Tate Black Award for Biography, and LA Times Book Award for Biography, and NAACP Award Image Award. Jonathan has appeared on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, Fresh Air with Terry Gross, and three Ken Burns documentaries. He served as consulting producer on the eight-hour PBS Muhammad Ali documentary. His next book is a biography of, of Martin Luther King. And now I turn it over to Jonathan. Well, thanks very much um, for that long uh, and <laughs> lovely introduction. Um, it's nice to be with you guys. And um, I, I'm a member of Anshay Emmett here in Chicago. And I know that John Norton um, is one of your um, colleagues and one of my good friends. Um, so I'm happy to be talking to you tonight. And I, I called the, this talk, um, How I Wrote the Greatest Biography of All Time. And uh, I think I can make that claim um, because it's a pretty good biography. And it's also the biography of the true greatest of all time. And uh, that's Muhammad Ali. And I know a lot of you probably have some Ali memories and some Ali stories. Um, but what I'll talk about time, during my time before I um, turn it over to questions is, is just how I ended up writing this book. I, I'm a guy who grew up an Ali fan. Um, I was born in, in 64, so I was not old enough to appreciate him in, his, in, in the true prime of his career. But by the time I'm, I became aware of Ali, he, was, you know, he had been back from boxing and um, I think I can remember the first Ali Frazier fight in 71. And soon after that, you know, bought a poster of Ali and put it on the, on the wall of my bedroom. And I don't think I appreciated at the time um, just what an interesting figure he was, um, just how um, extraordinary he was and how um, really unlike any other athlete he was. But some of it must have pierced my, my childhood brain um, because here was a guy, even in the 70s, even when, when I was a kid, who was not like the other athletes I was rooting for. Um, you know, he was, first of all, um, talking about politics. He was talking about race. He was talking about war. Um, even in the 70s, you know, he did this more in the 60s, of course, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But at the same time, he was, um, you know, he was also really funny and and I can, I'm sure all of us remember his interactions with Howard Cosell on TV. So here was this guy who was obviously very strident politically and racially and religiously, but also 
you know, yucking it up. I can remember seeing him on different strokes, you know, this, the sitcom. So a very hard guy to, to pin down and figure out. And um, then of course, you know, I'm aware of his, of his, of his great fights, um, not just against Frazier, but against uh, Foreman in, in, in Zaire. And then, you know, the, the end of his career, which is not a pretty picture as he, um, you know, fights Larry Holmes and loses the, um, um, looking like he, he he fought far too long. Um, and then, you know, later we see him as, a, as this kind of a world figure, almost like a, you know, a, a, a Dalai Lama, a religious figure. He becomes all things to all people. So this fascinating life, a life that touched on, on some of the most important issues in American history, race, religion, war, um, also had this great boxing to it. And yet he had never received a proper biography. He had never received the full-blown kind of big fat biography that we give to important American fi figures. And that's where I came in. This was, I guess, now shoot, uh, 10 or 12 years ago, I was talking to my friend Jane Le Levy, who wrote the great um, Sandy Koufax book that I'm sure many of you have read, wrote the great Mickey Mantle book. And she was thinking about doing a Babe Ruth book. And she called me to talk about it because in part, well, because we're friends, but also because I had written about Lou Gehrig and she wondered, you know, if there was anything new to say about Babe and if there was anything new to be learned from their time together with barnstorming in 1927. So we talked about it for a while. And then she asked me, so what would you do? Would you, would you do Babe or not? And I said, I would do it because other than Muhammad Ali, who's more interesting than Babe Ruth? And there's always going to be an appetite for more Babe Ruth books. And when I hung up the phone with, with Jay and I thought about it and I said, wait a second, Muhammad Ali, that's an even better idea than Babe Ruth. Um, and I thought I went to my bookshelf and I saw that I had, you know, books by Norman Mailer. I had books by George Plimpton. Um, I had a David Remnick book that covered only the early years of Ali's professional career. There had not yet been a full-blown biography. There was an oral history uh, by Tom Hauser, but that was just an oral history and it was written um, with Ali's authorization. So it didn't include um, some of the more negative things and it didn't include his ex-wives. So I realized that I had this amazing opportunity to, to write a biography of one of the most important figures of the 20th century and to write about somebody who meant a lot to me as a child. I think, you know, one of the most um, exciting and important lives of, of our time. And he, Ali was still alive. Um, in many ways, this was the perfect moment for me to um, embark on this project because first of all, um, you know, enough time had gone by that you could put his life in perspective. I wouldn't wanna try to write a book right now about Derek Jeter or even um, LeBron because um, you just don't know yet what, they, what their lives really mean. Um, you know, looking at this new Reggie Jackson documentary, I think we're beginning to have enough time to sort of put Reggie's career in perspective, but I think you needed time to really give Ali's story perspective. And 50 years had gone by since he became the heavyweight champ. 50 years had gone by since he joined the Nation of Islam and uh, changed his name from Cassius Clay. So it seemed like I could properly place him in history. At the same time, um, there were still lots and lots of people alive who knew him, who fought against him, who had been married to him. Um, and Ali was still alive, so I could do interviews. And, and I'm an old newspaper journalist, so um, the thought of getting out and knocking on doors and calling people up on the phone and meeting some of these, these people who knew Ali best was really exciting to me, especially after you know, some of my other books um, were mostly archival in, the, in terms of the research. So I set out and really just decided that I was going to be Ali's biographer. And one of the things I always tell my kids and I tell young writers is um, don't wait for someone to give you permission. If you've got a good idea, go for it. And I think it's true for anything. If you wanna start a business, if you wanna pursue a line of work, if you wanna make a movie, keep doing it until someone stops you or until you realize you don't have the, 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 the capacity for it, but why not try? So I began my journey by literally walking up to Ali's um, second wife, um, Khalila, who um, had been married to him for probably the most important years of his career. She was known as Belinda at the time, changed her name to Khalila. And she was married to Ali from 66 to, six, to 76. 
So from the moment he joins the Nation of Islam, really, um, until until the end, um, the peak of his career, she's with him through all the Vietnam War years. And I approached her at a at a movie premiere, and I said, uh, "Mrs. Ali, I'd like to." I, I, no, I didn't say I'd like to. I said, "I'm writing um, your husband's biography, and I'd like to talk to you." And she said, "Well, who gave you permission?" To, uh, to write his biography. And I said, nobody, but I really want to do it. And I want to make sure you're in it because um, your, your story needs to be told. And you know, one thing I've learned over the years is that everybody likes to be heard. Everybody likes um, to have a chance to tell their story. And Ali's fourth wife, um, Lonnie, had really controlled um, much of the storytelling around Ali over the last 20 years. Um, and Kalila had been shut out of a lot of that. So the thought that um, a new biographer was going to come along and give her a chance to be heard was 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 important to her. Um, didn't make it easy for me. Her response was, "Okay, I'll talk to you for six thousand um, dollars." And I don't pay. I said, "I don't pay for interviews." She said, "Well, you're going to pay for this one." Um, and I said, "I'm just curious. You know, why six thousand? Why not five thousand? Uh, why not ten thousand? She said, "Well, that's that's how much the other guy paid." Um, and some other reporter, some other writer had paid her for an interview. But I, I said, I'm not paying for an interview. I, I really just, um, one of the things that um, is, an, is an advantage to book writers, people like me who take five or six years to write a book, is that I have time. And it took me about a year and a half to persuade um, Jackie Robinson's wife to sit down for interviews with me. And um, it took almost a year for me to persuade Kalila to sit down for interviews with me, but I did eventually. And I, I did it by just showing her that I was taking this seriously, that I was doing the hard work. I, I interviewed a guy um, named Lowell Riley, who was a photographer for the Nation of Islam. And I found these photos that he had taken at Ali's wedding. So I, I purchased a couple of photos from Mr. Riley and sent them to, to Kalila, wedding her wedding photos that she'd never seen before. So she began to appreciate that I was, um, really working hard on this and that I was going to tell this story right. And um, eventually, you know, invited me down to her home in, in Deerfield, Florida, and um, did you know, the first of what turned out to be many, many hours of interviews. And that was really the opening for me. You know, once I had her um, talking, um, it was easy to get the people around Ali, you know, the hangers on, the people from the, um, from his, uh, posse, his entourage, uh, because most of them love to talk and they all want to be remembered as, as, as key people in Ali's life. Um, unfortunately, you know, Angela Dundee had passed away before I began and several of the other um, important characters like Howard Cosell had passed away before I began. But there were, there were many, many people who were close to Ali and I began just traveling the country, getting to know them, interviewing them. Um, one of the most important sources for me was a guy named Gene Kilroy, who was Ali's business manager uh, for almost Ali's entire career, pretty much from like the late 60s all the way till the end. And, and Gene knew everything and everybody. You know, he kept the books, he um, kept the schedules, and he became kind of like my godfather. He would pick up the phone and call people and say, you got to talk to this guy. He's doing this book and he's doing it right. And, and that really um, made things a lot easier for me. He called Don King. Um, he called um, Mike Tyson. He called Ali's third wife, Veronica Porsche. Um, they didn't always agree to talk to me, but you know, Gene at least tried to go to bat on my behalf. And I'll, I'll tell you a funny story about Don King. Um, when I first went out to Vegas to interview Gene Kilroy. We just happened to bump into Don King at the, uh, at the MGM grant. And uh, Gene introduced me to him. And, and um, Don King, is, as you know, is, is a little full of himself and full of bluster. And he's walking around with these two girls in bikinis and you know, they're promoting some fight. And he says, sure, sure, I'll talk to you, but you know, I'm too busy right now. Call me and, and, and I'll schedule something with you. So I call him and he says, I'm too busy. I'm working on Middle East peace right now. And, um, you know, the Israelis and the Palestinians are, are, you know, keeping me pretty busy right now. I call him again the next time and he says, no, I can't, I can't uh, talk to you. I'm, I'm working with the uh, LAPD on, you know, on stopping the, some of the, right. He's always got something, something going on. Um, and finally, um, I realized that he was going to be in Easton, Pennsylvania for a, um, for an event with Larry Holmes. And I figured Easton, Pennsylvania, there can't be that much going on. 
Um, he's got to be sitting around in a hotel lobby at some point. He's got to be eating dinner. I'm going to go to Easton for this um, ceremony for Larry Holmes, and I'm going to and I'm going to get Don King to talk to me. So I followed Don around all day. Um, sat down across from him at the restaurant. He was always too busy to talk. Um, finally, at the end of the day, we're in this loud, noisy bar. And, and you know Don King, if you know anything about him, he always says the same thing. It's always, you know, only in America, you know, um, cash is king, C king is cash and cash. Is He's got these lines that he just always uses. So I finally corner him in this bar in Easton. Um, it's late and um, he says, come on, bring your tape recorder, I'll talk to you. So I thought to myself, what am I gonna say? I've, I've only got a, one chance here. This is not an ideal situation. You know, I prefer to interview somebody in their home you know, with, uh, on the couch when they're, they're set up for a long, comfortable conversation. Um, what am I gonna say to get Don King's attention so that he, he actually wants to talk to me? And, and what am I gonna say so that he doesn't just give me one of his standard lines? And I had all day to think about it. So I was ready with my question when I finally got my chance. I poked, I shoved my tape recorder right in his face. And I said, Don, here's what I wanna know. How come nobody ever killed you? You're, you're taking money off of these fighters. You're robbing them blind. You know, you're, 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 you're dealing in cash. Um, you're dealing with the mafia. You're dealing with the nation of Islam. You're leaving a trail of angry boxers behind you everywhere you go. How come nobody ever killed you? And he just loved that question. Um, and he said, I'll tell you the main reason nobody ever killed me. When I, when I took Ali away from his, his uh, business managers, I went to Elijah Muhammad first at the Nation of Islam. And I said, Elijah, you know, you're, 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 um, you're letting all these white people make money off of Ali. We gotta keep it in the, in the family. We gotta, you know, you gotta let me come in and, and make the money. And the other thing is that, you know, I can help promote the Nation of Islam. Um, the Nation of Islam could be much, much bigger. The main thing you got to do is, is drop that ban on pork. You know, <laughs> pork is a pork is a beautiful, is a beautiful meat, is a beautiful meat, and pig is a beautiful animal. It's a clean animal. You know, you drop that ban on pork, and, and Islam's gonna take off like you wouldn't believe it. So um, Elijah Muhammad didn't go for the uh, idea on pork, but he gave Ali to uh, to, to Don King and with, and Don King felt like with Elijah Muhammad behind him, um, he had a level of protection. And um, then um, Don, I, so I, I was telling uh, one of, uh, I was telling Gene Kilroy that I finally got Don to talk to me. And he said, well, you know, Don's a really a social guy. Just call him tonight and ask him if he wants to go to dinner. Because now that, now that he knows you, I guarantee you he'll, he'll talk to you some more. So I called Don and I said, Don, I really enjoyed talking to you yesterday. And I was wondering if you want to go to dinner. And he said, oh, I can't go to dinner, um, but why don't you come to my Christmas party? Um, I'm having a Christmas party next week in, um, in Boca at my house. So um, I, I happen to be at, going to Boca actually because my in-laws live there um, as all in-laws do. And um, I took my kids to Don King's Christmas party this, the following week. And, uh, that was an experience they, they will never forget. Um, but getting back to, to Ali, um, in addition to interviewing the people around him, I set out on this journey to try to, to meet Ali as well. You know, and I, I went to Louisville and, and spent time with his brother, Rachman, who's still alive and um, was, was unfortunately living in public housing and on food stamps at the time. Ali's brother and, um, and Ali's wife, Lonnie, didn't get along and, and, uh, and Rachman hadn't seen his brother in, in years, um, which was really tragic. And um, I finally um, went out to um, Phoenix where Ali was living and um, Lonnie invited me to come meet him after several attempts where I, I would go to public events where Ali was appearing and, and try to meet him. And, and um, he either sometimes he didn't show up because he was sick and other times um, he just, you know, wasn't seeing any, any guests in part because he was frail. Um, but Lonnie invited me out to his house in, in Phoenix and I, uh, and she said, bring your daughter. I, my daughter was five at the time and Ali loved kids. So um, after this is, you know, two, three years into my research, I was so excited. I was finally going to get to meet him and I've never, um, met any of the people I've written about. They've all been long dead. Ali was the first time I wrote about somebody who was still living. 
So I took my daughter, uh, we went out to Phoenix, uh, we went out to Ali's house and um, Lonnie greeted us and welcomed her into the living room. And then um, Ali never came out of his room. He wasn't feeling well that day. And we spent two, two and a half hours chatting with Lonnie, hoping that, that Muhammad would come out and say hello to us. And um, he never did. And uh, it was hard to explain to my daughter why we had gone all the way to Phoenix to meet this man and, and didn't, didn't actually meet him. Um, but I left that day and um, a few months later, Lonnie called and said he was feeling better and he was gonna be in Louisville for um, an event. Sports Illustrated was, was naming an award after him and that she thought I should come and, and um, try again to meet Ali. So I went to that event and I went down to Louisville and um, met uh, Larry Holmes there, actually. Larry Holmes had also been really hard. Even when I went out to, um, to that um, event in Easton, Larry wouldn't talk to me. He was one of these guys who insisted that he, he wanted to be paid um, for an interview. Um, but when I went to this um, event in Louisville, Larry was there and Sports Illustrated had paid his, for, for him to come and, and, and paid him um, to do media interviews as well. So he had to talk to me. And um, Larry turned out to be one of my favorite guys I met in the entire journey. Um, we spent hours together, uh, you know, drinking at the bar at the hotel where he was staying. And once he um, got over the fact that he wasn't getting paid for the interview, he was just a lovely guy. One of the nicest people I met on the whole, on the whole um, book journey. Um, so Larry and I walked over from the hotel to this event where Ali was being honored. And um, I saw Ali come into the room and um, I rushed over to get to him first because I, I didn't, I knew once the, the crowd started trying to, trying to greet him, I wouldn't have a chance. And Lonnie uh, took me over and introduced me to him. And I put my hand on his, on his arm and uh, I introduced myself and he didn't really react. I couldn't tell if he, if he even knew I was there to be honest. Um, but I um, just leaned in and whispered in his ear and told him I was writing this book told him that I was um, trying to tell his story as honestly and as, as fairly as I could and that I would really just love it if he had anything he wanted to say. And he didn't answer. So I um, just sat there for, I don't know, maybe 30 seconds, just with my hand on his arm and waiting and listening and, and didn't get anything out of him. And I've reflected on that a lot. I, Lonnie took a picture of me, which I've never shown to anybody because I look so stupid in this picture. I look like the eight-year-old boy meeting his idol. Um, but um, I've thought about the fact that Ali didn't say anything. And, and for a guy who always talked so much, um, in some ways, I think it was appropriate that he, he, he didn't make it easy for me. He was you know, I had to do this book on my own. It was my book, not his, uh, my version of his life story. And one of the things you, you wrestle with as a biographer is that there is no right or wrong way to do the book. You, you only, um, everybody would do it differently. If, if um, one of my, uh, if Jane Levy had been writing the Ali book, it would have turned out completely different from mine. And, and that's true for every writer. So, you know, the biography is, is, is a, is a more, is more art than science. And it's, um, it's an art of failure really, because you can never really tell someone's whole life story completely. You only know the, the parts that were left for the public to see. You only know what people say about them. You don't know what they're hiding and you don't know what was going on in a subject's you know, mind. So I think the fact that Ali didn't talk um, in many ways um, was appropriate because it, it just, it was his way of saying that, you know, you're on your own sucker. So um, after that, um, Lonnie called me and said that um, Muhammad heard me and, and knew what I was doing and that he would like me to come and read him the book when it was finished. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away six months after that, and I didn't uh, get to go read him the book. Um, I, was, I finished it soon after he passed away, and um, it was published a year later, a year after his death. And um, I like to think that um, he would have he would have liked it. You know, one of the other things, challenges you have um, when you write about anyone really, but it's certainly a living subject, is that there's going to be things in there they don't like. And um, I talked to Lonnie about that quite a bit because she suggested that perhaps I should um, 
write this as an authorized biography and that she would um, grant me access. She would um, tell me her stories and that she would help promote the book. And I said, no, I don't think that um, I want to do that because I don't want anybody controlling what I can and can't write. Um, and I don't think that's in your best interest either. I think um, if Ali is to be treated like the important historical figure that I think he is, um, he deserves an honest biography, uh, the kind of biography you would give a president, the kind of biography you would give Martin Luther King, um, the subject of my next book, which we can talk about. Um, and I don't know that Lonnie really bought that. I don't know if she accepted that because it was hard for her to read about all these other women. It was hard to read for her to read about his mistresses. And I don't think she liked the book, but um, as I tried to, to tell her, because we got along nicely, um, is that people aren't going to believe the, the positive things if you don't include the negative things. Um, people aren't gonna trust me as the storyteller if I'm shading the truth to try to make him look better. Um, there's always a balance, you know, how much of the negative stuff do you wanna put in? But bottom line is, um, if the reader doesn't trust me, they're not going to really wanna go on this journey with me and they're not going to understand uh, who Ali really was. And, and Ali, the same is true for King, same is true for most of our heroes. They're great enough that we can handle the truth. They can, they can sustain a few um, scratches to their image. And moreover, I feel like we can't really ask people to emulate our heroes. We can't ask people to try to accomplish great things themselves if we expect them to be perfect, because none of us are perfect and, and we shouldn't expect perfection among our heroes. So um, Ali um, is a story of a, of a man with, with flaws, but I think those flaws make him make him greater because he, he I came away at least, and I, there were times when I was writing the book where I got mad at him and where I felt like there's just no way that I'm going to be able to um, feel good about him when this is done because he treated some people, in particular women, so badly. Um, he handled his money so badly. He fought too long. His ego was, was massive, but I still came away liking him more in the end than I did at the beginning. And I think that's in part because in his own strange way, he was incredibly modest. Um, and it sounds funny to say about somebody who went around calling himself the greatest all the time and who may have been, truly been a narcissist, um, really believed that if he did it, it was the right thing to do and that the world would somehow come around to his way of thinking. Um, he reminded me of Donald Trump at times in that way, that there's just never going to be any admission that he could possibly be wrong about anything. Um, except that Ali had a great sense of humor. And, and that makes it go down a lot easier uh, if you're going to be you know, an egotist or a narcissist. Um, and our former president did not seem to have that ability to laugh at himself the way Ali did. Um, but the thing about Ali was um, that he never really thought of himself as being better than anybody else. So when he said he was the greatest, maybe he was really saying that we were all equally great. Um, he's the kind of guy who would, and, and I'll bet you in this group of, um, you know, dozens that we have joining us tonight, that somebody's gonna tell me a story about meeting Ali and some act of incredible kindness that he did because everywhere he went, he would stop and try to do nice things. If you, if you came up to him in the airport and asked for his autograph, he would, um, he would spend an hour talking to you. If you said, oh, my, you know, my, my brother is your biggest fan, he would say, let's go find a payphone and call your brother. Um, he would literally, like when he was bored, just turn to a page in the phone book and call somebody and say, hey, it's Muhammad Ali, you want to talk? Um, and, and he had this belief that like he could spread joy wherever he went. He's the only guy I know who would actually go to the airport early just so he could spend more time mingling with people. Um, he would stop the car in traffic sometimes and just wait to see how long it would take for people to, to come over and start talking to him. His love of other people um, was just phenomenal. And his, his childlike, um, sense of humor, never faded. Um, one of his friends told me the story of, this is when Ali was you know, in his 50s or so, and he was slow and um, you know, Parkinson's was really getting to him. And they, they came back to their, they were in Japan and they came back to their hotel room very late and Ali was exhausted. And he saw that all of the people had put their shoes outside their doors because people didn't wear their shoes, I guess, into the rooms. I've never been to Japan. I don't know if that's universally true. But he saw this 
long hallway with nothing but shoes lined up in front of all the doors. And very slowly, very tired, though, though he was very tired, he walked up and down the hall, um, switching all the shoes in front of every room <laughs> so that people in the morning would wake up and have to sort out where their shoes were. Um, and that was just, you know, so many joyous stories of Ali that I heard and I continue to hear. And that's one of the great blessings that Ali has given to me in my life is that everywhere I go and everyone I, every time I give a talk about Ali, somebody afterward um, tells me another story um, about, about his magic. And um, I could, I probably could and probably should um, record them all in a book um, and it would probably sell better than my book because that's the kind of like uplifting stuff that we need these days. And I think that's ultimately why Ali was so beloved. Uh, I said this earlier that he had this ability to confront us, to push us, to challenge us, uh, especially on issues of race, and to really think about why um, we were as backward as we are. Um, and at the same time, he did it with this twinkle in his eye, so that you could tell that he still loved us and that he, you know, that he that he cared, and he was never coming at it with with a sense of anger. Um, and I wonder sometimes what those conversations were like between Ali and Malcolm X, because Malcolm um, lacked that twinkle. He had lots of fire, but he didn't have that same spark that Ali did. And the two of them together might have, you know, must have been a fascinating uh, team. So I'll conclude. I'd like to, uh, you know, wrap it up and just talk to you folks and take some questions. Um, but um, I'll just conclude by um, quoting another one of my favorite. Um, people, and that's Thelonious Monk, who said that the great, greatest geniuses are those who are most like themselves. And I think that was Ali. He was, he knew exactly who he was, and 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 that's all he ever gave us. There was no artifice. He was showing us who he really was, and and I think that's why people responded to him because they could sense that genuineness within Ali. And um, I think that's why I still get, and why m many of us still get, um, you know, goosebumps when we think of him. He was truly one of a kind. Um, so I will look for questions in the chat, and, if, and I'll leave it up to my um, moderating friends if they want to unmute anybody, but um, I see I have one question here. Um, did Larry Holmes have any regrets about the neurological mental problems that Ali developed after the beating he took that in that fight? Um, really good question. You know, one of the things that really surprised me, maybe it shouldn't have surprised me, is that the people who fought Ali are still angry at Ali for taunting them, they're angry. They, these are men who are warriors. So George Foreman, for example, is still really pissed. He believes he was cheated in that fight in Zaire. He believes he was drugged by his own manager and that um, the referee was paid off uh, to give him a short count in that fight. And I said, George, you really believe that you were drugged by your own manager? And he said, I don't just believe it, I know it for a fact. And um, he, he told me, I'll get to the Larry Holmes question in a second. Um, George said to me, I found out um, that Ali's manager bribed the referee $10,000 um, before that fight because they were worried that I was gonna knock Ali out so fast. And they, um, they were worried that, that um, they, wanted, they wanted to make sure the ref might give Ali a slow count. So I called Gene Kilroy and I said, um, Gene, um, Foreman says that, that you guys bribed the ref in Zaire. He says you gave him $10,000. And Gene says, that's ridiculous. That's bullshit. That's the stupidest thing I ever heard. We only gave him $5,000. Um, but to get to Larry Holmes, uh, again, the opposite. Larry Holmes had no remorse. Larry Holmes was pissed um, that, he, he, that, that um, Ali was an idiot to keep fighting. Um, and... He was ang he was he was traumatized by the fight. He was you could see afterwards he was crying and having beat up his hero. He loved Ali, but he was angry um, with Ali for his greed, for his stupidity. He he, he was brutal in terms of co criticizing Ali for the way he treated women in particular. Um, he said, you know, you couldn't bring any any young women anywhere near Ali. He was he would you know he would. I won't repeat the foul thing <laughs> that he said about Ali. Um, but um, these guys are still warriors at heart. And I think that it's hard for them to come around. You know, they've, 
Foreman in particular has been trained to say nice things about Ali, call him the greatest and all that, but he still thinks he was a better boxer, still thinks that he deserved to win that fight. And that's just the way these guys are wired. Um, I see there's a question about the biopic and one night in Miami. Um, I did not like Will Smith as Muhammad Ali. I thought he completely lacked that, that, that which is amazing because you think about a Hollywood superstar could not match Ali's charisma. And I think the, some of it might be the director's fault, but they played it in the, as Ali as this very strident, you know, militant um, kind of guy. And, and, and the, the charm wasn't there at all for me. Um, One Night in Miami, I have mixed feelings about. Um, I didn't think it totally worked as a story. Um, I think it was probably better as a play. I didn't get to see it as a play. Um, but I liked the actor in that one who played Ali. I thought he was, um, he was pretty good. I can't remember his name. Um, what cost DC in 1998? Oh, see, uh, I knew I'd hear a nice Ali story. Len Gold tells us that he met Ali at the Holocaust Museum in 98. And um, it's nice that he was there for that. If anybody has been to the Ali Museum in Louisville, if, if you haven't been there, it's really worth the trip. It's terrific. Uh, I should put in a plug, um, speaking of the boom movies and the biopics, we're working on a new TV series about Ali. Uh, Morgan Freeman is the executive producer, and uh, Kevin Wilmot, who wrote A Black Klansman, is writing the screenplay, um, adapting it from my book. So um, fingers crossed, um, maybe within the next year or so, we'll see that on the Peacock Network. Um, but I'm learning that Hollywood moves very slowly and sometimes doesn't move at all. So, I uh, can't make any promises on that. Any other questions? You, you have an impressive range of books you've written from sports figures to Capone. What drives you to choose the subject? Oh, well, it has to be something I'm really passionate about. It has to be something that I feel like I can add something new. Uh, I wouldn't want to write a, just another book, of another you know biography of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, there have been too many good ones already. So I'm a, an old school newspaper reporter, and I think to myself, what can I do that hasn't been done? Can I find new material that other people haven't found? And that's why I did this MLK book, which comes out next month, and I hope you'll all pre-order right now. Um, and if you want a signed copy, go to Unabridged Books uh, online, and you can order a signed copy at personalized there. Now that I put in my plug, um, I'll just say that when I was interviewing folks for the Ali book, I was interviewing Jesse Jackson and Andrew Young and Harry Belafonte, um, Sidney Poitier, um, I, and Dick Gregory, in fact, um, mentioned something about King, and, and, and it occurred to me that I had this chance to ask people questions about King, that these were people who knew King, and we, we tend to treat King as if he's ancient history. Um, there hadn't been a King biography at that point in 35 years. It's now been 40 years since the last King biography. And it occurred to me that I had this unbelievable opportunity to interview people who knew King. There were dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds of people alive who knew King very well. His older sister, older sister, let me just emphasize that, is still alive. Martin Luther King's older sister is still with us. So I figured using my reporting skills, just knocking on doors, interviewing people, plus digging through archives, looking through FBI records that have been released in the last few years, I could find a lot of new material. And um, that's always a big draw for me. That's like, you know, raw meat in the lion's cage for me. Like, if you tell me that there's a chance that I'm going to find new material on somebody who we think we know already, um, that gets my juices flowing. And, and that was absolutely true for Ali. Um, nobody had done the, the kind of hardcore reporting that I love to do, you know, turning over every page in the archives, knocking on every door, calling everybody from the high school yearbook. And the same goes for, for King. Nobody had done that in a long time. And a lot of the people who had written about King were academics. And they don't really ask, like, what was his dog's name? They don't really ask, you know, what was what kind of cologne did he wear? Um, I want to create, you know, I want to give my reader a sense of that they really get to know these people. And um, especially felt I felt like that was especially important for King because we've turned him into a monument and a national holiday and a postage stamp. And we've forgotten that he was a man, that he suffered from depression, 
that he, um, you know, struggled um, at times um, and that he had doubts about his, his work and about his life. And we need to see that. So um, I hope you'll read that book. I hope you'll read um, both of these books. Um, so there's a question here. I think a really good question. How do you think he would want to be remembered? Do you think he'd want to be remembered for his boxing or do you think he'd want to be remembered for something else? Because he certainly did a lot of things through his life. I mean, the whole, th I grew up just like you following him and, you know, the whole, the whole not going into the army, and jail and changing the name, and Nation of Islam and Malcolm X. There's a lot of things, I mean, and then some of the not nice things that you talked about too. So I think it's a really good question. Yeah, um, I think first of all, Ali was incredibly proud, obviously, of his boxing abilities. And there's a reason that he called himself the greatest. And even when he was getting older and he had Parkinson's, nothing excited him and nothing helped lit him up more than um, just throwing some punches and pretending to be boxing again. Um, no question in, in my mind that he would want to be remembered as the greatest heavyweight champion of all time. Um, but I think especially later in life, his religion became very important to him. And he viewed it as, as, a, as his life's work to teach Americans that Islam was not a, lang was not a religion of hate and to teach uh, Muslims that America was not a country of hate. And he devoted a lot of his time and his energies to traveling the world, trying to spread those messages. So, um, and you know, very humbly um, studied the Quran. And and you know, when he was in the Nation of Islam, he wasn't really um, learning Orthodox Islam. He was, you know, a member of something that was more like a cult than a religion. But once Elijah Muhammad died, he became truly, you know, spiritual and and religious, and and made up for lost time in studying the Quran. So um, I think, you know, he'd want to be remembered as somebody who served God as well as somebody who, uh, who, who boxed beautifully. And I, I see there's a question about the relationship between Ali and Cosell. And um, it's a great question. And I would recommend a, a terrific book by Dave Kindred called The Sound and the Fury about that relationship. Um, my take is that they were not really close friends, that it was more of a, of a business relationship and that they, they cared for each other for sure. And they appreciated each other and they understood how each was good for the other's career. Um, Ali um, recognized that it was important to have somebody who would tell his story in the press and tell it the way he wanted it told. And Cosell um, was one of the first, really one of the only people in the media to respect Ali's religious choice early on and to say, of course, he, we should call him Muhammad Ali. Well, the New York Times and, and most other news outlets continued to call him Cassius Clay. Um, Cosell said, you know, Cosell had changed his name too um, to, to sound less Jewish. So he could appreciate um, that, you know, anybody who wants to change their name should have the right to do it. And we shouldn't criticize somebody just because we don't understand their religion. So Cosell deserves huge props for being out front of that. And I'm sure the fact that he was Jewish had something to do with that. But um, I think that they, I don't think they were, they were, they ever dined at one another's homes. I don't think that um, they had a very intimate, close, uh, intimate personal relationship, but I do think that they, they respected each other and, um, and, and cared about each other for sure. So I have a question for you, Jonathan. Um, so the world has changed since he's passed away and certainly, you know, even before he became sick. Um, so has he ever did he ever talk about Israel? I know he 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 liked the Jews. He was certainly not an anti-Semite, any stretch of the imagination. There was a story of the chat about the Holocaust Museum. And uh but being a um uh, uh, a Muslim, and, and certainly today that would be pretty toxic, I would imagine. But was there ever ever talk about Israel or the Palestinians, or was that never really even brought up because it was a different time? Well, I think Ali never really cared to get into the details of politics. He was always on the side of peace and brotherhood, and he would travel anywhere in the world uh, to try to negotiate, get hostages released, or whatever the case may be, to, to stop war. Um, but when it came to the details, he 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 got lost and sometimes screwed up. You know, the U.S. sent him on a diplomatic mission <laughs> to try to promote um, uh, the boycott of the uh, of the Olympics um, in in Russia, and and 
Ali just everywhere he went would say something different. And he would Remember say, that. oh, yeah, you know, what, if somebody said to him, you know, the Russian perspective on this is totally different, he'd start espousing the Russian position and the State Department handlers would have to like, just kidding, shut him up <laughs> because he would he would just he, he wanted to agree with everybody. He, he really um, did not care to get into the, the uh, into the nuances of politics. Great. Uh, this was fascinating, fascinating. We can't thank you enough. David, you want to? Yes, yes, I would. OK, so I'd like to thank uh, Jenny Mando, my, my co-chair, my IT mavens, Rick, Rick Ronsbury, Craig <laughs> Cohn. I want to thank you, everybody, for joining the program, and especially to our, our guest, Jonathan Eig. It was a, uh, I really, really appreciated what your talk. It was absolutely terrific. Um, I was I really uh, watched some of Muhammad Ali's, Ali's fights on TV, and I was it was amazing to watch him and read about him and what a, a superb athlete he was. So it, it was an amazing presentation. I really got a lot out of it. All right, so I want to thank everybody again tonight, and um, that's all I have. And good night. Thank you very much for being. And uh, thank you very much, Jonathan. That was a terrific. Thank you, terrific. Jonathan. It was great, Jonathan. I enjoyed myself. Thank you. A lot. And uh, thank you, Jonathan, and your parents for being here as well with us. That's Absolutely. right, mom and dad from Thanks a lot. from Enjoy months. talking to you guys. Thanks for having us. Good night, mom and dad. Looks like dad's asleep. Oh, <laughs> good night. Good night. Good night. I, know sleep. I know what that's like. Thank you, son. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.